Thanks, Lan. Welcome, everybody, to our uh, second Chicago Booth Alumni event for 2021. Uh, we're going to continue the uh, series on the impact of uh, the COVID pandemic and, and business. Last month, we touched on the impact on small business and entrepreneurship. And uh, this month, we're going to uh, touch on uh, innovation. So welcome to all the Chicago Booth alumni and the uh, alumni from University of Chicago, as well as alumni from uh, other business schools in, uh, the, in the Southern California uh, area. When we were uh, looking at the programming for the first quarter of this year, and we knew we wanted to touch on this topic, uh, somebody said, hey, you got to check out this amazing article in the Chicago Booth Review, uh, written by a professor named Lindsay Lyman. And the name of the article is Four Ways to Ensure Innovation Continues After the Crisis. And I uh, thought it was terrific. We reached out to Lindsay to see if she would uh, moderate a panel for us on this uh, topic. And uh, she graciously agreed. So I'm gonna, um, uh, I'm gonna hand it over to, uh, to Lindsay to moderate uh, today's panel. If you have any uh, questions, please enter them in the Q&A and uh, we'll uh, be sure to, uh, to take those. And uh, we're gonna go for about an hour, but we will be able to run past that a bit if we need to. And uh, Lindsay, I'm gonna turn it over to you to um, get us going. Great. Thanks, Mike. Uh, and thanks to all the panelists and everybody who's participating this evening. Um, so let's start there. The pandemic has caused a lot of forced experimentation uh, for all of us and all of our businesses. Uh, and I would love to hear from, from each of you, what is one uh, forced experiment or change, so to speak, um, that you have done in your businesses uh, what has worked, what has not worked, and what have you learned from that? I can start. <laughs> um, hi, um, I'm Vivian Rhodes. I'm the VP of Innovation for Pharma, PharmaVite. We make nature-made vitamins, um, and we're the number one vitamin company in, in, the, in the U.S. right now. So the, the biggest thing that we had to do is that um, immunity was not uh, an area of focus for innovation for us. Um, and it was something that we have immunity products, but it was not, you know, front and center besides, you know, um, your vitamin D, which we, we are the leaders on. But um, I think the, the big thing that we had to force is that we had to come up with a pipeline <laughs> pretty soon. And it was really just after, you know, we all started working from home. It was early April and we said, you know what, we, we, we need to come up with this pipeline. And so um, for the first time, really, we, we pulled the teams together and figure out products that we had in the, in the old vault or products that we could quickly make or we could connect with co-manufacturers. And, and come up with a pipeline. And we launched five products in August. It was the shortest ever time to market that we ever had. And I think that the experimentation and the learning that is that, you know, there were some failures and there are some, some things that didn't go right in the launches of those products or the making of the products. But the, the decision we made for the company, it was really uh, great to see our CEO coming in front of the company and say, hey, when, when the choice is opportunistic and speed and being timely to market versus being right <laughs> or being you know, complete and having checked the boxes that we feel comfortable with, we won't compromise in safety, <laughs> but we will uh, take risks. And so that was kind of the big learning and, and something that we are even talking now on how you know maybe the you know the the time the length of innovation that we had before was not necessary. We showed that we could cut a lot of steps there, and kind of that's the legacy that that's keeping for the organization now. So I think that was going to be my follow up question on speed. Do you think the speed is sustainable, and is that something that's going to stick after long? There's no longer this forcing mechanism to get new products to market specifically. Uh, due to the new needs of the pandemic. Yeah, and yeah, we're just uh, rolling out a real uh, different process um, and within PharmaVite now to keep up with the speed. And we're, we're applying a lot of tools like the, the hypothesis mapping from Strategizer, for example, of 
really looking into what are the areas that we really need to focus on and the things that we can let go and kind of lining up our organization towards the highest risk hypothesis and you know the uncertainty that can make it or break it and then questioning everything else that we're doing so actually it was uh, something that we want to we want to stick to awesome cool thanks Bob, Kathan, any 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 changes that you've been forced forced to make that you otherwise might not have experimented with? Yeah, I, Vivian, I couldn't agree more. I, I think back to you know the five years leading up to 2020. Um, you know, large strategics and small brands were actually you know coming closer together in terms of innovation. You know, with almost every large strategic you know ramping up their you know pace of innovation launches and launching um, venture and incubation arms, which is ironically. Um, where, where Vivian and I met working for PepsiCo's incubation arm uh, probably 10 years ago now or close to 10 years ago now. But in 2020, we saw um, a pretty dramatic shift as strategics, you know, lean more heavily on the you know, legacy brand extensions. Um, you know, the example I, I think of that's near and dear to what I do in beverage is, uh, is Coke Energy and, you know, even Coke's broader initiative to dump their zombie brands and focus on brands of scale. Small brands, on the other hand, um, you know, they've, they've struggled with the investment that's required to break through retail. So their focus really heavily turned to e-commerce uh, innovation strategies, which, you know, in some cases meant packaging, um, you know, innovating out of glass and into cans, more, more e-commable uh, packaging. Uh, in other cases meant formulation shifts from, you know, chilled formulation, you know, we're trying to play on on the fresh trends, the consumers demand for fresher, fresher foods and, and, and the required uh, cold, cold chain to uh, shelf stable formats um, as well. So all of it just kind of being in the name of, you know, becoming more e-commerce friendly. Um, and then, you know, probably a little bit more opportunistically during the pandemic, achieving a longer shelf life is, you know, panic pantry loading uh, was happening out there. I can provide um, a little bit of a different lens um, so my name is Kathan Magani. I'm a strategic innovation executive at Salesforce. I'm part of an innovation um, group within Salesforce that advises um, Salesforce's um, largest uh, clients. Um, and we're used to actually doing things um, in person. Um, I'm part of a human-centered design arm of Salesforce. We, um, we actually are designed to interact with each other in person. We sit in what we call bays. Um, which uh, have um, boards where we put our, we actually show our work. Um, and it really is an immersive environment. Um, and when the pandemic hit, uh, we were at a loss of words. We didn't really know how to shift and how to work since we had a set way and set um, uh, approach to um, understanding and uh, solving problems. Um, but we um, started to look for solutions. And um, I'm sure many people um, in this forum have heard of the tool Miro. There's a few tools out there, um, but uh, we were able to adopt that and actually have become super proficient, proficient at it. Um, and uh, now I almost feel that Miro uh, for us is maybe even a preferred way than, than doing some of the um, older ways that we were working. So it'll be interesting to see once um, the pandemic is officially over, when it, if or when it is officially over, um, what uh, the way that we um, work will look like, because I do think that um, the, the new normal is not going to necessarily be the same as um, the normal that we left. We're gonna talk about the new normal as well late, later on. So th thanks, Kathan. Albert, what's changed in your business? Um, what what I mean force changes have happened? Yeah, I'm actually in a unique position because I'm more, we're more of a strategic, I'm, you know, I'm more in the strategic consultancy. So we, I usually play a fractional CFO or CEO overall. So during 2020, we had two major clients that were on the exact opposite ends. One was a streaming video technology company where, you know, again, they're a mid-sized company, but as we all saw the, the change of streaming, uh, you know, with the emergence of um, you know, windows being broken, you know, for those on the line that are from the studios, you know, theatrical windows were the one of the most impeccable things you could never touch. It totally got steamrolled and it changed and broke every boundary. And the company that I was advising as CFO came in looking at streaming from a live events standpoint. So they got killed because immediately most of the college sports that they had contracts were were canceled for the fall. So they actually had to pivot considerably and they ended up 
you know, again, it just shows the whole innovation of being really quick and being willing to change everything I've done. Their whole sales team switched and was working with sales to basically go and say, what can we do with our technology? Because we're not going to earn any money off of all the contracts we have because they're all for sports that are not happening. They actually became one of the leading providers of the technology that streams events to basically the movie theaters, uh, the the drive-in movie theaters that we all saw at the parking lots. So that actually became their new revenue and they became known for it because they did those live events and a lot of, they just did Owen McGregor um, and not Conor McGregor's fight. Uh, and I actually laugh because half of the uh, locations were places where it was snowing in the Northern upper States in Minnesota. And I think where Kate and you are in Chicago. I'm like, how's anyone seeing anything? Because I'm sure your windows are fogging up, but it just really showed the ability to try to change where the sales and marketing you know, sales and de development teams usually are very separate teams, but because of the change, it definitely merged the way they thought things through. And then meanwhile, on the other side, I was actually being a COO for a commercial real estate company here in Southern California that had 20 million square feet of unfortunately retail, which is the worst place to be. But what they did was just be bold. Again, I think it has a similar kind of mentality of breaking the rules. And I think Lindsay, it goes to yours, is challenge the status quo, the things that guide us and made people say, we can't talk to that team or we can't talk to this partner. They actually went on a very aggressive streak because their big thing was, well, if retail already was going bad because a little company called Amazon's been killing retail, is they actually started working with the local uh, municipalities because entitlement is one of the biggest challenges in all real estate. It's uh, basically entitlement is when you want to switch it from real estate of retail, let's just say to homes or multi-tenant or mixed use, it takes a lot of time. But because of all the changes, a lot of municipalities were willing to be much more flexible than they had ever been before. And it was a lot of change because in their own mind, it, you know, it doesn't sound innovative, but it is a change of how you interact with your partners is the, the, the founder basically and the CEO basically urged his team, you have to be aggressive. You have to use this opportunity. And it didn't work all, everywhere, but in several locations in Northern California, Southern California, they broke through things that usually took five years. They're now down that path and probably won three years of work um, just by using this opportunity. Oh, thanks. So Albert, that's a good segue because my, my next question was going to be, uh, to talk a little bit about your customers, how how have your customers' businesses changed, and how have you had to innovate in the way you work with them and serve them? I can kick things off here. Um, our customers, um, many of them, uh, might have thought of technology and adoption of technology as a nice to have instead of a need to have. Um, many of them might have thought that it was a part of their three to five year roadmap. Um, and basically the pandemic has fast forwarded everything um, uh, in terms of adoption of technology and thinking of new ways. Um, it's forced many companies to rethink of their technology strategy. Um, and as a result, we're just seeing a lot of customers embracing technology in a way um, that they're just not used to. Um, more from a personal working perspective, um, as I talk to some of the, the clients I work with, they're um, figuring out um, what their new norms are looking like, whether it is um, the way that they work, uh, the way that they show up to work, um, wellness, work-life balance, um, all of these things that uh, sometimes we're competing with work. And many times um, there was an assumption that work should prioritize over these things. I think many of my customers are realizing that um, for them to be um, sustainable organizations and, and really good to their employees, they need to learn how to balance and find and help their employees find balance and making sure that they're taking care of themselves, their well beings, whether that is um, uh, being a little bit more flexible and accommodating. Uh, in terms of family needs, um, in terms of taking time off, um, in terms of uh, actually maybe not being able to be completely present in some meetings. I see that there's a lot more empathy um, that is happening in how uh, many of my customers are approaching um, work and managing their organizations. Yeah, 
I would add to, you know, Caden's approach since, you know, in a consultancy role, I'll go back to that CRE company. We were actually engaged in January um, from a, you know, strategic project to basically make them more modern. That was something their founder CEO wanted to do. And we ran to immense, the first two months where we were going nowhere. And ironically, COVID actually made this one of the best cases I've ever worked on because it really opened and created that pressure. I think, Lindsay, you've mentioned in willingness um, to adopt new technologies because again, they, if you guys remember the movie, you know, Moneyball or the book, you know, there's the old fashioned uh, commercial real estate guys who are like those old scouts. I just have to stare at it. I have to see it. I need it. I don't need the numbers. And you had a new breed that were all about the numbers. And then you actually saw the change because they couldn't go out. They couldn't meet people for new properties that they were looking at investing in. They had to start adopting a lot of these new technologies. That's where I think a lot of people see, especially in Southern California, the emergence of these property technology companies really burgeoning because the classic firms need this data now because they can't go out. They can't pound the street like they used to talk to people. And so data is becoming more important. It's changed how they work. But I think it goes to where Caden uh, brings up and maybe someone we'll talk about later is the human factor is unfortunately I saw with that client and we're still helping them is it's now creating a rift between I hate the old guard and the new guard and the new guard kind of views it this is their opportunity and they still have not figured out that new norm of how they operate together because it's now given more power to one group over another and it's one that we're still trying to synergize to get that fine balance of getting the most out of that team. Yeah, and Bob and Vivian, you, you kind of touched on the future of retail and the shift, the, the rapid shift to e-commerce. And we, we had been on that glide path for a while, but that happened a lot faster um, than, than we expected during this time. How is collaboration between CPG suppliers and retail, how has that changed um, in, in the past year and, and how do you expect that to continue to evolve um, with respect to e-com or any other shifts that are, that are happening within retail? Yeah, and as a, as a private equity investor that really prides themselves on you know, being there day-to-day -to, -day to really help out with day-to-day with -day business operations for our portfolio companies, I think collaboration was an area that we really um, you know, uh, focused on during, um, during, especially early on in the pandemic. You think about um, you know, some of the businesses we're investing in, they're not fully built out in terms of their people capabilities and their organizations, right? They may be a five, $10 million revenue company that um, you know, can't afford a CFO yet. And so um, you know, going to a bank and applying for a PPP funding is a foreign concept. So um, we immediately start focused on things like, hey, let's do some you know, finance roundtables or, or CFO roundtables, whoever the senior most you know, finance person organization is. Because if you recall with the PPP funding, it was being piecemealed out and guidelines were changing literally by the day. And there was just a lot of confusion out there. So to be able to you know, um, bring all of that um, brain power in amongst you know, our, our nine or 10 portfolio companies um, around you know, just a collaborative effort to go get it done because everyone, you know, no one's competing here, right? Everyone's kind of uh, wants the same thing in this, um, I think was, uh, was, was, uh, you know, one of the areas we focused on, um, you know, quite a bit. So I think, um, you know, and you mentioned e -com. I think so many, um, you know, consumer brands, um, given, you know, my comments earlier on, especially around small brands turning to e-commerce, um, you know, uh, both because the traffic was down at retail, but also just because uh, the expense to really trying to launch something there, launch new, new and new products there became more challenging, um, you know, really, uh, you know, escalated as well. And so um, we had brands that were digitally native um, in our portfolio versus brands and businesses that were, you know, kind of more uh, the traditional playbook of starting in retail and maybe not um, for any for a variety of reasons, not scaled and not even uh, beginning footprint yet in e-commerce, and so to be able to kind of bring those uh, together too uh, to share best practices uh, between the two, I think was was pretty valuable. So um, I think th those were a couple of areas we, we focused on in addition to you know kind of the initial um, you know triage, even for the, our most successful companies, right? Uh, especially early on, it was just very very much unknown. Yeah. Um... You know, from a, a retail perspective, it's, it's, it's such a transformation. Uh, there's certainly the e-tail piece, but, you know, we're also working 
biggest customers, Costco, Target, Walmart is is the first of all managing out of stocks, right? I think that that the big we always talk about toilet paper and what happened there, but vitamins and supplements were just behind that uh, incredible surge in demand and us being able to really, you know, focus on the mix and we're even thinking about manufacturing and focusing on the big SKUs and making sure that they were getting um, the stocks that they needed as they, you know, started opening the doors more often, but also the, the e-tail shift, right, and the click and collect. And, um, you know, with the click and collect, it's many, for some retails were completely new without much data. I even, you know, I had a meeting last week that they, you know, one of the retailers start really big, but they still cannot see the data on how much goes to click and collect and how much goes in, you know, to the store. They just ran to do it. You know, they're still trying to catch up with their systems. But, you know, the, the, the demand surge in vitamins um, hasn't stopped. Um, even January was a bigger vitamin month than in March or April last year. Consumers continue to kind of shift into that, um, you know, I can do, I'll do whatever it takes for me to, you know, protect uh, myself or, you know, um, make sure that, you know, I'm doing what I can uh, to, to keep up with my immune system. And um, now it's, it's very interesting because, you know, nearly a year later, a lot of the conversations is how, how do you control supply and demand? So now you're trying to look into how do you manage the out of stocks given competition, every, com every company vitamins and supplements right now are in allocation, but you know, which, which ones do you focus on to make sure that you're not losing shelf space? Because that's the time that, you know, it's, it's super critical, right. To keep uh, service levels as, as high as you can be, but but then there's also, you know, the other side and it's the human side, you know, of managing essential workers, you know, uh, we, we, you have manufacturing sites here in the US and you have, you know, to make sure the priority number one is safety um, of your employees. So it, it's like, how do you cater for that and ensure that we're, you know, meeting as much as we can as the demands of, of consumers and, and retail. It's a, it's a balance that still, on on today you know nearly a year later and i think it's going to continue for a little while um as, as consumers co keep you know we have we started a tracker a monthly tracker on sentiment around health and wellness and what we hear is it's unanimous and it has held steady on how consumers are still saying that they're going to keep their behavior health and wellness behaviors uh higher than you know pre-covid um, and they're shifting spends in categories, right? Obviously, there's so, some winners and losers in how the money is being shifted from some categories to others, and health and wellness is, is, a, is a big commitment uh, that consumers continue to play back with us. Yeah, Vivian or Kathan or, or Bob, do you have insights on how consumers are going to change their behavior? I mean, are, are consumers going to want to go back to picking out their own bananas so that it's the perfect green versus yellow? Or are they going to continue to rely on, you know, these these pack and sh ship delivery? Do you have a sense or a we'd all love to have a crystal ball? Uh, but from that perspective, how consumerism and shopping is going to shift or where that balance might might land when we come out of this. Yeah, I don't. I don't think there's any question that you know the quantum leap we just took in terms of share of, um, you know, particularly grocery, which is you know kind of more near and dear to what I do. Um, you know, that there's the e-commerce share of grocery is going to you know maintain itself and continue to climb, um, and and for consumer products in general is going to continue continue to climb. Um, there's always going to be um, a good faction, a, a healthy swath of the, the universe that loves to shop retail, right? There's an experience there that just can't be replicated um, by e-commerce. And so, um, you know, it's, it's difficult at this point, right, to, to put a, a number or percentage around that. But um, I tend to believe, um, particularly on the, you know, food and beverage side, um, and especially you mentioned like fresh produce, right, that uh, that there'll always be a healthy uh, amount of that share in retail. And I think a lot of it's incumbent upon, you know, retailers to kind of react now. They've, some of them have done a good job of, 
um, Vivian mentioned before, click and collect and building out their own, you know, e-commerce, e-tail type platforms. But a lot of it will also be incumbent on them to create um, a, a more exciting retail experience. Um, I think about, you know, the way Whole Foods was 10 years ago and being able to go in there um, with all of the unique SKUs they had, uh, the over service that they would give you, um, you know, employee per, per customer. Um, you know, that's a bit, a bit played out and, it, and also a bit hard to make money doing, but um, it's going to be incumbent on them too to make it worth going into a store for clearly. So, uh, but I, I do think, I think there's always going to be a healthy uh, swath of the population that is absolutely going to continue to, to want to go to retail and, and is going to get a follow through on it. Yeah. 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 And, and it's interesting to see, you know, the, the experiences, the experiences are not only kind of your target experience that you think about. It's exciting that people talk about, especially uh, parents talk about as being a break in their day. When we look at what Walgreens is doing, what CVS are doing, as far as the experiences being about your, your place where you're getting the advice, when you're getting the diagnostics, when you're getting your care, they're paying a lot more attention about pharmacists and the education that pharmacists can, uh, can give about health and wellness and kind of a more integrated solution. And it, it plays back with that democratization of health, uh, of not just thinking about going to your doctor to get, you know, your prescriptions or to get your advice. So, so they're becoming destinations uh, and, and, you know, hubs for health and wellness and making a lot of investments on that. So I, I would see that they're, you know, it's not only about buying a product. Um, it's a, a lot more than that. Yeah. Yeah, in terms of industries that I think um, are really um, almost benefiting from the pandemic, I, you almost see a, a fast forward happening because of the pandemic. Um, take health and health and fitness, right? Peloton was up triple digits um, quarterly revenue to last year because there was a need for at home fitness, um, and it, instead of trying to. Um, schedule a fitness class around your existing schedule. Like now fitness is coming and, and, and adhering to your own schedule. And it's funny, you see like Apple being a fast follower in, uh, in some of these industries that you would never think of. Um, another one is actually apparel, right? So think of all the dry cleaners and all of the, um, the uh, um, uh, corporate wear um, institutions. I know Banana Republic had a, a change um, in how they're kind of handling fashion and they kind of have repositioned themselves. You have like the athleisure companies that were always doing very well, but now all of a sudden um, how you, uh, uh, your workwear is also your um, loungewear. And so Lululemon is up double digits. And um, instead of having a huge wardrobe, people are trying to consolidate and make, um, and make every piece of article that they wear uh, actually count. So you're actually, you're seeing a lot of the, the trends and the behaviors that were happening pre-pandemic just speed up and, and fast forward into the future. Um, Kathan, that's a good, a good segue actually to my next question. Um, what if some, uh, some surprising or unexpected things that have, have come out of the pandemic, either unintended consequences or unexpected benefits or, or problems that arise that, that have arisen um, either in your businesses or your customers' businesses? What's been surprising? Yeah, I, 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 can, I can talk to that. I think one of the, the biggest surprises of the night, um, it, it's, it's it's weird to reflect back to a year ago. So Nature Made is, is a brand that's been around for 45 years. They kind of helped create the vitamin uh, supplement industry. And um, before the pandemic, the year before, six months before we did a, a rebranding. And um, one of those examples when rebranding our consumers, our core consumers couldn't we're not finding um, the product. So we started declining after a long time. We, we went into a decline and um, quickly realized that and, and you know, went back to uh, a, a new and improved or back to, to the, the, how it used to be. But I think that the big surprise, first of all, how from, from being in a decline to suddenly outpacing the growth of the category, in, in a matter of you know five months, 
And uh, it's just the realization, and I keep thinking it's back to Pyramid of Maslow and how you think about it, but people going back to legacy, legacy brands and brands that stand for the quality has ever always been around and, and to the safety of it. So Pharma by not only we, you know, we had the label that helped us grow, but we, as we look into where growth came from, the label change, you know, was just a small piece, but a big piece was really the, the, the going back to, to basics. Um, so I think a lot of legacy brands that have been struggling <laughs> in center of store um, have seen a resurgence. And, and again, when we, when we talk to consumers, again, it's not just something like, okay, it's whatever I could find. It's some of the basic values that I think are going to be pretty foundational, even generational, that when, when, you, when you hit a pandemic, when you hit a scare, humans do go back to, you know, safety and comfort. And, and I, I think that was, that, that was a big, big thing that, that we saw in our business that was surprising. Vivian, do you think that's going to sustain or stick? How are, how are you kind of taking advantage of this opportunity and making sure that that sustains? I think it's further differentiating that and bringing more of the equity of, of the brand on, on why we are the, the, the place where you can go to. So, for example, a big part of the brand is pharmacist recommendation. Uh, the you know, number one pharmacist recommended now we're blowing it out in a huge way and to, to the point that I made before of connecting with, you know, with the pharmacists in the retail that are part of that experience that's very important kind of to that core uh, VMS user, but owning it, owning it, not being apologetic for being, and that's the part about legacy, legacy. It, it, the example I gave on the label is like you're trying to modernize your brand, but there's a point that we're seeing actually own what you have, own the equities that you have. Uh, they're important. You have to build and make sure that you're not staying behind. But there is there is a, a, a core value there that it connects with the consumers. And I think it's going to connect with consumers uh, for a while. If, even if you think about, you know, other traumatic events that we we went through with with 9-11 and we go back to that and see kind of what some of some of the behaviors that happen in people and we we, we see some some correlations with what's happening today yeah i would just add to vivian it's like interestingly my my core business i've always been in is video technology and it's like it goes to i think what bob and Vivian we're talking about is the power of brands, right? Of legacy brands is what we see, you know, what we've really seen is I've been in the industry for a long time uh, previously. And it, it's like, like streaming has been around for 20 years. Anyone that's been in video technology knows it's been around for 20 years. And for the first 15 years, it was like, who the heck's going to do it? You know, who's going to make it, you know, YouTube broke out, Netflix broke out and made everyone realize, but everyone's like, okay, other than those guys, who's going to really do it? And what you saw, at least in the technology world during COVID, was the breakout of, you know, you're seeing it direct to consumer with retail, with a lot of brands going, especially small brands and even legacy brands going on their own directly to the consumers to really leverage their, uh, their relationship in media space. You see it with Disney, Warner, you know, all of them going paramount, name it. They all went on their own, breaking out of the contracts. Now Netflix is kind of viewed as the legacy player because they were the one that aggregated content. Now everyone's, I want to go directly with you uh, at the firm I'm doing the CF, um, uh, fractional CFO for us. We saw a huge amount of inquiries based off of mainly in Europe because they're still playing their sports. In the U.S., we kind of stalled out. But like tier, even tier two sports soccer league or football teams are literally trying to go streaming on their own. They're not going through merge cable vision and they're trying to merge it on their own so that they have a relationship leveraging their fan base so they can communicate directly and kind of build up anticipation of upcoming games it's not just content now they're trying to really pull it into the lifestyle of that person so the interesting thing is we saw a huge leap forward of technologies being adopted to really allow those companies we all see it with shopify's Stock went through the roof during this period of time on the retail side of e-commerce, but the same thing we're seeing in video technology with everyone that's a content owner is saying, I don't want to sell it to ESPN my rights. I want to have it directly my own relationship where I can market not only the content, but merchandise and ticket sales.
<clears throat> cool. Yeah. So, I also, mm -hmm. Go ahead, Bob. I also think, you know, it's a trend, this, this consumer long tail economy, this long tail that, that's developed in the consumer economy in general, not just in food and beverage. Um, you know, it was probably pre pandemic where it really started, where I think, you know, there was just, we, we've gone through such a tremendous age of innovation over the last 10 years. I know we, in food and beverage, it's been unbelievable. There've been so many good products produced, but it's also led to, um, you know, this point at which uh, there's a lot of choices out there. And so much of it in food and beverage, for example, has been around health and wellness. There's some consumer confusion out there as well. And there's just all, you know, almost too many choices. And I think that's one of the reasons, too, you're seeing, um, you know, scale and legacy brands and brands just that have been more developed and, um, you know, by, by, you know, definition are more trusted out there in the marketplace, um, you know, winning again. It's certainly not to say that uh, there's not brands that are being created today that are going to become the next, you know, billion dollar brands out there or brands of scale, stuff that really res resonates. But I do think there's this period of settling right now. And I think, um, you know, larger brands and, and, you know, brands that were further along um, are the ones that are, are, are the beneficiary, beneficiaries of that. And I think that that probably started even before COVID, but just another trend that COVID really accelerated. So I have one uh, one last question for all of you, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to um, everyone who's joined us for 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 Q and A. But you know, we we've, we've kind of been through this arc over the last year plus now, from crisis survival mode to getting comfortable to operating in the new norm in, in the current you know uh, situation, and now businesses are looking to, okay, we see the light at the end of the tunnel what does what does the new normal look like for our business what what is one of the key things that each of your businesses are actually actively in, investing in um, in the pursuit of setting yourselves up for success once we move into the the new normal so to speak what does that look like and what are you doing to an actively invest to make sure that you win when we come out of this I can I can talk. Um, the I would say that the we did, we haven't talked about this the topic of diversity and inclusion and how much also uh, this year this last year has been uh, very uh, fundamental and kind of shook a lot of a lot of uh, of bases there. So uh, I I would say that that is a big change um, of the new you know, return to the office or not return to the office and keep me mentioned about that, embracing diversity, focusing on belonging regardless of where you are and opening up discussions about, um, about you know, gender, sex, uh, sexual orientation, um, ethnicity, uh, race. And um, really for us, it's been so, um, so foundational, I think, to the setting of the culture, because it has been, a, a, I would say, one of those years that that's when you set cultures of company, what direction you take, and it has been so, so foundations from a sense of having essential workers and caring about safety to and making sure that well-being is integrating into people's lives um, and diversity and inclusion that um, I think when we go back to the office, we're going to be different, we're different uh, different people, to be honest, in all this journey that we've said, the personal journeys that we also had to go through throughout the year and managing our own personal lives, managing our own amount of stress and anxiety and leading people at the same time. So I, I think those, the cultural piece of it, it is, is the part that, that is really going to be uh, the biggest shift, I would say, for, for the future. Yeah, I, I'd like to build off on that. Um, I think um, for for us, at least my group, um, we are challenging orthodoxies, right? What did work look like before and what can it look like in the future? Um, we're already having discussions on when we return back to work, is it going to be four days, five days, two days? Is it the same day? Are they different days? Um, how will we work to make the most... Um, uh, to, to, that's best for our clients as well as for ourselves. And I think every, every aspect of our work, which was once kind of unspoken or almost an established norm is now being challenged yet again. 
And one thing about the length of the pandemic is it's given everyone a, um, a chance to really reflect on what's most important um, and, and how do they personally show up best for, um, for work. And so there's a lot of things that um, were challenging. Um, it, even when we do go back to work, um, how are we making sure that um, everyone's voices are heard, right? Are, if half the people are remote and the other half are in person, what does that mean for dynamics? Um, so we are kind of going, starting from the top all the way down, making sure that we're reevaluating what has worked in the past and then what's important for us to kind of move forward. Yeah, Albert, you actually mentioned earlier, I think, I think it was you that mentioned, um, you know, just the, the human dynamics that have come out of all this. And, um, you know, maybe it's, it's, um, it's, it's rose colored glasses a little bit here, but I've seen a lot of compassion, um, you know, come out of this. And I think, um, you know, one of the companies that I work with or, or advise um, is a company that's business model relies heavily on um, on being able to be inside of Whole Foods stores um, and merchandise there and provide it. The name of the company is Dirty Hands, which is pretty aptly managed. They, they essentially help out emerging, emerging food and beverage brands on shelf to, to, uh, to get all the jump balls you want to get as an early brand at Whole Foods. But early on, obviously, they, were, they, they, they had immediate protocol shifts in terms of Whole Foods did in terms of limiting the amount of time that they could be in store. And so um, given this company, Dirty Hands relied pretty heavily on, um, you know, for revenue, their business model, they had to make a shift. And, and I kind of love what they did. They, they called it right away and said, before we have customers that just start canceling on us, let's go to them and say, you know, transparently, here is the, you know, here's the, the, um, the, the limitation that we're up against. Here's what we're doing about it. And because we're only going to be, be able to offer two thirds of what we have in the past, we're going to slash uh, our pricing by two thirds and, um, and to a customer, they kept everyone um, and their business. I mean, it's, it's a really great story that their business actually grew in 2020. Um, and, I, and I think a lot of it had to do with, uh, I think people will remember that for years, right? Their customers will remember that for years and help them pick up business as word got around. So that, I think that story um, in that example replicates itself, you know, many times in terms of uh, just a renewed sense of compassion that, you know, you'd like to think that, with all the social unrest that's happened and that happened in 2020 and continues, uh, that you know the compassion will grow uh, as as human beings. I, I'm just gonna probably like uh, I'll I'll add to that. I agree with that, and you know I think I, I might pitch uh, Lindsay's uh, article if no one's read it yet uh, and use her uh, one of her statements, which is challenge orthodoxies, which is you know really something we work with you know and all the teams I'm working with right now is as we even look forward is, you know, a lot of these things where people really looked outside and kind of, you know, unlocked of what their norm was, is we were really trying to get, again, it's, it's a lot of corporations have that challenge is how do you embrace your inner entrepreneur or a startup kind of mentality is to not really, you know, view that the status quo is what locks you in. And we're trying to drive so that the employees keep a little bit of that. You know, there's, there's definitely the, the pursuit to return to normalcy, but there was a benefit because people were willing to think out of the box. And it definitely did help push these companies that we work with to, to get to where they needed to be. And COVID definitely helped some, it hurt them in some areas, but definitely by being more open to new ideas and new ways to engage with their partners, it really basically, we hope will, you know, be something we can continue in the future because it definitely resulted in some unexpected results, but a lot of them were really great for the companies that involved. Cool. So we have a question in, in the chat. So I'm going to pose that to all of you. Uh, and if there are any other questions, please put it in Q&A and we'll, we'll, we'll shift gears here and try to um, get through all these. So um, Marco, thanks for the question. Um, Marco says, Vivian made a great point about data. Uh, data during COVID might not well correlate to past data and poorly fit into <coughs> old analytics models. The situation seems to give an advantage to data-driven organizations that are agile and can quickly adjust their models. Becoming agile doesn't happen overnight. How can companies, which typically struggle with change, switch gears and make changes quickly? Who would like to take that good question? <laughs> well, I can kind of start things off. You know, typically when working with organizations that might not have 
um, adopted either agile methodologies or might be kind of um, used to establish norms. What we found, what I found is that um, you almost need uh, two, um, two starting points. One is um, you need some advocates on top of the organization, advocates that will model the behaviors, advocates that will make sure that um, there's room for change to occur. Um, and so you having someone um, in, in the top of the organization, making sure that it becomes a priority, um, I think uh, becomes essential. But in addition to that, you need to have um, advocates throughout the organization actually believe in the change. Um, it can't just happen from the top. You have to have individuals who um, understand that change is necessary, um, that are willing to become uncomfortable, whether it is um, in this case, using data to make decisions, um, maybe challenging norms, challenging um, approaches. Um, I think orthodoxy is a word of the evening, challenging orthodoxies. Um, and, and, and slowly but surely you start to change culture and you start to change some of the things that, um, that uh, the organization has kind of been used to. I don't think it happens overnight. Um, it, there needs to be time allocated, um, energy, and a lot of patience. Um, and, and it does take, um, it, it does take a, a commitment um, to make sure that uh, you are um, following the changes and, and giving enough room for the changes to occur before you kind of pull the plug and go back to um, where you were at. So um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not a, um, a quick fix, but um, from what I've seen, it's well worth it, especially in a time like the pandemic um, when you are in a, in a zone to actually reset, reflect, and think about doing things differently. Yeah, and Kathan, can I actually build on that? You know, one thing I'd say is, you know, it, obviously, the, the top-down change, the overall organizational change doesn't ever happen quickly, especially if you're in a big organization. But I would challenge everybody to think about what their span of control is. Yeah. You, have the, you have the power to start doing things differently within your span of control, even if those above or outside or beyond you are doing things more slowly and differently. So I would challenge everybody to say, you know, what, what is something different I could do that I have control over to start to set new norms and culture within my group? Yeah, I'd like to build on that. This was, was, was coming through my mind. So uh, PharmaHide was not an agile organization. And when I came in, I created this, this group, Incubate, and we, we, we apply Agile from Agile Software, we're Scrum team, we run all kind of the, the experiments and all of that. But what sold for the organization is that we are a minimum viable product. So we actually apply the, the model and MVP and into the team. So uh, we kind of size the team with a level of investment that the leadership team would feel comfortable for us to be the prototypes and protocepts of an agile organization within. And um, like I mentioned early on, that's when, you know, two years later, we're kind of rolling out bigger. Not only my team triple, so we're three scrum trained teams. We actually started seeing that experiment, but we started seeing other parts of the organization wanting to understand what's agile leadership? What is it being an agile leader? What are some of the, you know, the experiments that I can be doing in my organization? So I think that there is, obviously, I think that, that there is a key support from the leaders of the organization, but they didn't have experience either. But they, you know, breaking it down to some to a bite that they could chew, especially in innovation, when you say I need to be faster and I need to be, have more iterative learning, uh, incorporated into the work, it feels very obvious. So there are parts of the organization that's faster to, to imagine, but I would encourage you, and we still use this, this experimentation and uh, word in, within as we think about the organizational and cultural um, change. Cool. I think a lot of it is, is, you know, looking to the best examples and being honest with yourself about if you've got, you know, competitors, you know, doing it better and not being afraid to, you know, admit that and, and you know, replicate or, or take best practices. And I keep going back to this contrast between, you know, retail and e-commerce, but I do think during the pandemic, um, you know, especially obviously the beginning that it was, you know, 
e-commerce, the Amazons, you know, of the world that were um, leading the way because they're just used to operating faster, right? Their data comes faster, their, their transactional data comes faster, their supply chain, um, you know, operates faster than traditional retail. And so, um, you know, certainly it didn't always translate given the enormous shift that happened their way towards, um, you know, uh, timing of, order, of, of, you know, deliveries for consumers. But I would tell you from a, a supplier standpoint, uh, having portfolio companies that dealt with both, uh, you know, the, the, the world's biggest retailers as well as, um, you know, e-commerce venues that they were well ahead in their thinking and their speed. Um, at reacting to building up inventory of, of essentials, um, all of the things that people were concerned with early in the pandemic. So I, I think, you know, there's a lot of, of, of retailers that, you know, have probably taken, um, you know, taken a lot of lessons away from that. Cool. Um, so Mike, I think you have some more questions that I can't see. So I'm gonna turn, <laughs> it, I'm gonna turn it over to you to moderate some more Q&A. Thanks, Lindsay. Great conversation so far. Again, everyone, if you have a question, please enter it in Q&A and we uh, will take it. Uh, but we did have a couple of uh, questions that came in uh, with the registrations. So, uh, and I was thinking about this just you know, in the past week as we saw this disaster play out in Texas uh, with the whole uh, energy grid and then you know, lack of water. And our daughter lives in San Antonio as so we were kind of living this as parents in real time. Um, and, and, and the question is really, what is your biggest lesson learned um, from the past year? And how are you going to prepare for the next downturn, major economic change, even black swan event? Uh, black swan event. So um, how has the past year changed your thinking? And, and then even the past week changed your thinking in terms of uh, the next uh, big unanticipated thing? Yeah, I think it goes to that whole thing we've all looked at as resiliency became the big word of COVID, right? You know, not only individually, but also business-wise is our ability to look at our portfolios collectively and say, you know, what can we do with it? You know, again, we go back for me with the, the video technology company, we were literally dead in the water because we made all of our bets. You know, it's a mid-sized company that's been around for 10 years and they put in a lot of bets into the theatrical business. And when that just shut down, they literally were like, wow, this was supposed to be our big money maker the second half of the year. And they had to pivot, you know, and they had to look at what's in their portfolio to really go and, you know, change what the teams were working on and, you know, really have the teams rely on each other. As I said, it's where sales started actually for the first time talking to the development team because we were getting real time feedback of, okay, what's going out there? Because everything, I think a lot of organizations were throwing spitballs against the wall, seeing what would stick. And you were trying to match what you had with what was out there. And I think it just showed the power of resiliency of a team to be able to very quickly. And again, I think it's being decisive and being willing to make the change and move quickly and then adjust later, you know, knowing that you're not gonna be perfect um, and things can change. And that's what I think you just have to have that forgiveness, which I think it goes to where Caden and Bob and, and Vivian were talking about is it's that cultural mentality is it's difficult depending on the firms that you have, but I think it is that compassion that Bob said that did emerge that allowed walls to be broken. And I think that really helped resiliency. And it's something I'm hoping that we can retain in the firms that we work with. Yeah, I can build on that. Um, I think pre-pandemic, all of us were used to um, having our heads down and um, just trying to be smarter, faster um, in everything that we we did. And we definitely took a time out because of this past year of like, who are we doing business with? What's <coughs> important? Um, how how do people work um, at their best? But um, Mike, what you you brought up actually brought. Um, uh, made me think of what something that happened last week. I was working with an agency, um, not necessarily asking them um, about anything outside of work, but just kind of heads down and moving forward, even within the pandemic, until I realized that they were based out of Austin and they didn't have any power. Um, they were struggling to keep up with work um, because they needed to, they needed to get, get jobs done, but they were in a very different place that 
I didn't know of and many of their other um, clients probably didn't know of. So just maybe even taking the time out to um, have a half a human moment um, to understand where the people that you're doing business with, be their partners, clients, customers, no matter who the stakeholder is around you, just trying to have a, a, a sense of how they're approaching um, their work, I think, can go a long way. And we're, we're seeing that because we're not working from a workplace to a workplace. Now we're actually going inside people's homes, right? Like we are um, meeting people's pets. We are meeting their children. Um, we are entering their lives. And I think having that level of empathy um, should be something that we, we have going forward. If there's not a pen, if, if whether or not there's a pandemic, whether or not there's um, a, a catastrophe like what happened in Texas, I think it, it just, it's a part of who we are and it's a part of something that we um, have to remember going forward. Yeah, yeah. and Mike, Mike, if I could add one more thing, I think, you know, the, the whole, how do you, how do you be resilient and navigate when, when there are things that are out of your control or you couldn't possibly see coming, they happen. And I think one difference between how large corporations tend to operate versus entrepreneurs tend to operate is large corporations spend a lot of time on risk mitigation, which isn't bad, but it's this mentality of let's think about every possible thing that could go wrong and let's put an airtight plan in place that allows us to either mitigate those risks or have a, a be able to jump to a, to a crisis you know, resolution when they do happen. And entrepreneurs realize that they couldn't, they can't possibly be prepared for everything that's going to be thrown their way. And instead they focus on, you know, the lemonade principle, turning, turning those catastrophes into experiences to do better, to innovate, to move forward, to work around them. So I think it's also a mindset shift to say, look, we're, we're not going to be able to, to create a risk mitigation plan for everything that could possibly go wrong. But what we do need to do is create capabilities to be able to, to adjust on the fly uh, and, and, and deal with the unexpected when it happens. Yeah, well, well said, Lindsay. I think one of the things I think about, um, you know, amongst the leaders in our business, I know it was an overused term, but, you know, the wartime CEO or the wartime, you know, business leader. And um, you, we saw a lot of great examples of that in our portfolio. And I think one of the common threads you know, amongst the, the, the really strong leaders that emerged, um, whether it was at the top or just, you know, in, in some sort of people leadership position was communication is always really important, but, um, you know, really the over communication there, because if you think about it, it, again, early on, it was a lot of change, um, you know, different people take on change at, in, in different ways. And so the constant um, over communication just becomes so critical to, to let people know that, you um, you know, uh, no one has all the answers right now, and and uh, we're, you know that that uh, you know more of a collaborative effort that we're going to figure it out together, and um, and being able to to you know get there uh, together as well. I think it was was critical. So um, yeah, I think I think I think it's a really good point. Yeah, we had a, we had another question uh, that came in. Um, this one's specific to the to the hospitality and travel industry, just in terms of what the new normal is going to look like. But I think we could probably generalize this to any of the industries that were really hard hit, really impacted uh, by the pandemic. Um, you know, what, what is the new normal? And, and, uh, and, and what should we be you know, expecting to see there? I, I know that it, it, um, in uh, my research, we do cover uh, the travel and hospitality industry, and we've seen a pretty dramatic shift in, in the airline industry with um, at least one of the majors really downsizing their fleet. And uh, just obviously there's just gonna be a smaller airline going forward. And then you compare that to Southwest who's expanding. You know, they added uh, Santa Barbara to Las Vegas, I think, because one of their most recent you know, uh, route expansions. So, so um, any, any thoughts there in terms of either travel and hospitality or any of the other really hard hit industries? 
Well, I can speak at least from the retail uh, commercial real estate. That's, side. that's a, a definitely uh, a hard hit industry, Albert, right? <laughs> yeah, those two are, you know, I think what you're going to see is just a massive acceleration of something that was already going on. It's something I think we, a lot of us have mentioned. It's like a lot of the trends, this COVID like compressed everything. Things that probably was stretched out five, 10 years, people would have probably fought change. And, and we see in the CRE industry, you know, there's going to be so much conversion of like retail space. You're going to, you know, I think we're all expecting, especially here in Southern California, I've seen a lot of the plans. I see what's going on. There is so much multi-family, multi-unit kind of development where you'll see mixed use. Almost every mall, I would say 50% of the strip malls that are not class A are probably going to switch to some mixed use in Southern California. It was already happening, but now the cities are compressed. They need the money. So an application is immediate cash to them. So they're willing to listen before they're like, we need to go through, it'll take years to make the transition. You're gonna see a lot of transformation in industries that were already gonna change. They already knew they needed to do it. Amazon has made the dent and COVID just like, I hate to say, put the dagger in, at least in Southern California and a lot of regions that you're seeing a transformation. Once these things happen, especially in real estate, it's not like my other world, I mainly live in tech, we can pivot on a dime. Once commercial real estate goes into that, you're talking about 10, 20 year spans. So I, I kind of foresee in the next five, 10 years, you're gonna see a whole landscape change and, and hospitality is getting affected with it because we've run into several, you know, we were looking at purchasing several properties, the company I was working with, um, hospitality and, and they lost out because they were being aggressive saying, hey, good property, good place the hospital could come back. It actually went to a developer who's gonna transform it into apartments because you know, multifamily units actually didn't get hurt unlike retail or hospitality. Hospitality is the most defaulted segment of the real estate industry. Um, you know, the darling right now is industrial, but right. uh, you know, now, that, now the problem is you'll probably see way too much industrial mm -hmm. um, coming up in the next 10 years, more than you ever want. But I think what you'll see is a whole landscape change of how we shop, how we interact and it's gonna be a lot of this multifamily where you have stores at the bottom and people living on top. And it's, it's a transformation because the great thing, at least here in Southern California is retail's always in great locations. It's in places where, you know, it's near highways, it's near yeah. where people work. So there's a lot of demand and it'll change. But the main thing is now that that ball's rolling, especially in the real estate world, you're gonna see things that are gonna, it's gonna stick for 20 years because you can't go back on building a multi-million dollar, multi-billion dollar facility. So, so, so Albert, kind of building on that, that theme of real estate and tech, um, one of the trends we've seen is this kind of flight from the Bay Area for uh, employees. And as we, as we move to this kind of new normal of work at home or hybrid work environments, we're, we're getting to this point now where you can at our company, we have um, the CEO has said uh, you can work from anywhere. And uh, my wife works for Oracle. Their CEO moved to Hawaii, and he also wrote a memo that anybody can work from anywhere, including Hawaii. Uh, so how how is that uh, how is that going to impact innovation? Uh, how is it also impacting how you're thinking about your workforce? Are you now thinking um, that you can? Um, higher uh, across the United States or even globally? Uh, and then also what's gonna be the impact on, um, on uh, the demand for your top performers? Are, are you gonna see uh, your top people potentially uh, leaving because they can work for anybody anywhere? Yeah, it, it, is, it is very interesting. Um, Certainly, it, it, there are advantages of being able to recruit and have talent from anywhere that you can and have access to it. Um, I think there are jobs that um, still need that face-to-face -face component. And um, I, 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 I'm, I'm recruiting quite a bit still, but I'm, I still haven't made the shift and the commitment of being 100% remote. Uh, we've recruited people that now they're they're in in Boston, in uh, New Jersey. But the plan is when the offices open up, at least for a couple of days, that we, we're going to be there, and we want um, you know to be able to have a collaborative work style because innovation, part of innovation, especially in that early discovery 
Um, there are certain things that we miss. We miss being consumers' homes. We miss having still the collaborative um, um, workspace. And um, I think especially now, a year from now, we've, we're feeling more that we could for a while make do, but now it's the time. No, actually, we need to find better ways of replicating that. So I do think for a lot of industries, um, it, it makes sense, but I you know, I, I reflect a lot on what's the right thing for us to do in the type of job that we do. And I still value a lot the face-to-face -face, uh, collaboration. Yeah, Katon, you guys just built that giant building in San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, we've, um, we've invested quite a bit, not only in San Francisco, but there's one coming up in Chicago, many cities around the world. You know, um, our CEO, Mark Benioff was just saying that, um, uh, it's up in the air, right? Like, uh, it, it's really based on what employees want. If employees do want to come in to the office and there will be a segment that do, um, there will be space uh, for them. If they want to work remotely um, in other places, that is fine as well. Our workforce, a large chunk of it was remote um, to begin with. So the shift of, of being remote is maybe less painful than maybe some other industries or companies. Um, one thing that I, I, I will say um, is even though we may not be, um, we might be a little bit flexible of where people are, I think uh, workers are still craving that sense of community. Mm -hmm. um, and we are thinking of unique ways, different ways of still fostering that, even if we can't be physically in the same place, whether that is... Um, um, having meetup groups, whether that is having different interest groups, ways that people um, can kind of come together um, uh, with their work coworkers and with their work community, I think is really important um, because there is a lot of fatigue. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of isolation that is happening. Um, we're seeing an uptick um, in many industries of a uh, need for um, psychologists and people and therapists to make mm -hmm. sure that people are able to perform at their best because they might be overworked at home because there's a lot going on or they might feel very isolated. So e even if um, people are able to kind of be a little bit more flexible, I, I do think that there's going to be investment and need for making sure that we can connect people together. So, yeah. so, so, so Lindsay, I, I know you've done some research in this area and probably have some pretty strong opinions about it. Um, what's your thinking today? And has that thinking changed over the past year from where you were last April? You know, the <clears throat> one fact that remains is that, you know, humans are social creatures and humans have needs and humans biology does not evolve at the speed at which the changing workplace is evolving. Um, and so to Kathan's point, I think there is there, there are a lot of changes that look great on paper and do have benefits, right? You know, CFOs are falling in love with the notion of not having any of these travel right. expenses or, 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 you know, um, office expenses and all this sounds great. And there's a lot of, lot, there are a lot of benefits, right? Access to, to talent, flexibility, um, for many uh, workers who have disabilities, this has kind of leveled the playing field. So there, there are undoubtedly benefits to this, but nobody's talking about the costs. And um, Keith, and to your point, you know, me mental health, sense of belonging, sense of culture, um, the way humans trust each other is, is by being together and building relationships. And I, you know, maybe we'll be able to do that virtually, but I, you know, I think there's a, we've seen the last year, once you have pre-established relationships going into this environment, that that's a different, you know, different than trying to establish relationships and trust with others for the first time. So um, I, I, I'm a little more bearish on this thought of the future of work is all virtual from wherever you want and everything's going to be great. Um, I, I think it'll be a while until we can actually quantify the long-term costs of this and figure out what the right balance is so that we can benefit from the benefits, but not, um, you know, not swing too, too far in, in that, in that end of the pendulum. I would love to live in Hawaii though. That sounds great. <laughs> well, maybe we can open a satellite campus, yes. maybe the new Hong Kong campus, but it'll be in Hawaii. 
So we'll, we'll, we'll make sure alumni relations uh, gets that message loud and clear. <laughs> uh, so, so we did have an, another question that came in, sort of that's, that's kind of related. Uh, we, I know that our, our clients actually asked us to expand our research coverage to include work at home. So we, so we set that practice up last year. And uh, one thing that we're finding uh, that ties very directly to this question is, um, the, the question is how do you onboard and train new staff in a remote environment, number one, but then number two, how do you convey the company culture virtually? And I gotta tell you, in the research that we're doing, we're finding these to be the two of the top issues that companies are struggling with. How do you train and onboard new employees? And, and then how do, you, how do you ingrain them in the culture um, when everybody's you know, working home and, and remote? So um, I don't know, Vivian or Bob, do you wanna start on, uh, to start us with this one? And we'll go to yeah, I, think, actually, I was actually gonna bring this up um, on the last question. I, I think that's another dimension of like the variability and flexibility of this, which is yeah. like ten, tenure of working with the people. Um, you know, we're a small group at First Beverage, we're, we're the private equity firm I work at. And I feel like we were extremely fortunate that we'd all been in place for two, three years um, at a minimum together, working together in person, a lot of, you know, just a lot of, um, you know, familiarity with each other and our styles. And that really allowed for a very efficient period during COVID when it was nothing but Zoom calls versus if we had just onboarded someone or we're, we're hiring someone during COVID, like. I don't think there's any substitute for, you know, how you team build, um, you know, with a good deal of that being in person. So I would still be a really strong advocate of um, if it's, you know, an onboarding situation where someone's going to be working closely with a team for, you know, a, a, you know, a long period of time that there's got to be, you know, a fair amount of that um, in person. Um, I also think, you know, the, the, the nature of our businesses were, you know, in terms of in, on the investing side, we're, we're not, we're not getting into forever marriages, but we're getting into very long-term relationships. And so we talked about it early on. Could we actually make an investment without ever meeting someone in person? And I think mm -hmm. we were pretty resounding no, because we've always said that we want to see them in, you know, early stage investing is so much on the people, right? That we, we not only want to see them in, in, in our conference room and going down and visit them in their workspace, but we want to see them in social settings. We want to see them in, in every possible um, setting you can because, um, you know, like I said, it's a, it's a long-term relationship and you're going to go through a, a roller coaster over the course of the, you know, five or 10 years that, uh, that you're together. Yeah, I, I love what you said. Yeah, there's no substitute for face-to-face, -face, but there are times that the work needs to be done by someone. And, and that, that's one of the things that in the beginning of the pandemic, we were kind of holding up and say, okay, this is the amount of work, but let's pi keep piling up on the people who are already there. It came to the point that we said, no, we actually need to go hire people because we're just adding to the stress that and, and the amount of work that, that everybody's doing. So, you know, the trade-off was too great. And I, you know, I don't know what we're doing. It would be very interesting that there are four people within the team that started since the pandemic, uh, and to ask them how the, how it's going. But um, you gotta first of all, it's ongoing onboarding. It's not like you're onboarding. You do you know one on ones with everybody. Goes to a couple of things and then you're in. So we actually have like weekly plans of of you know going and attending other mm. other department meetings and, and kind of getting to know people. Um, we also um, have for my team uh, a day a week, we have our happy hour. Um, <laughs> our happy hour and we all get to it and compare what wines and beers we're having. Uh, but that, and we, it's mandatory to tell a story. So you come in and everybody tells a story and usually a funny story and we have themes and getting down to, you know, laugh together and like be silly together and hear about the adventures of the other people, I think broke, broke the ice um, on, on that. And then it's just, you know, forcing the conversation, you know, one of the times that if you don't have the hallway, you have to create the hallway, right? So we do establish every other week you know, I make sure that I'm talking to everybody on the team, that I have those 10 minutes at block time that people can come and stop by and having a lot of peer-to-peer -peer touch base too. And we schedule them, you know, make sure you might already be talking to the person, but at least at that time, you, you're going to be touch basing with people. 
So like forcing the hallway interactions have been, you know, um, a big deal for us. But it, yeah, that's, that's, that, that's so important. I, I host a podcast around work at home and we had the CEO of a startup called Pizza Time on. And uh, Pizza Time is a service that will deliver pizza to everybody on your team at the exact same time. And then uh, for an extra few bucks, he'll, you, you can hire a karaoke um, coordinator or something. So, uh, uh, Albert, Ketan, uh, your thoughts on um, onboarding and uh, culture? Yeah, I think it just goes to culture. It's, I, mean, I, I, I kind of lean toward Lindsay because, you know, being my original view is as a tech person, bring it on, re, remote's great, and it'll be wonderful. And we see it with the technology firm that I'm with. You know, we've onboarded probably over half our team during COVID, and it's turned out great. But again, I think it's one, the psychology of who you hire. A lot mm -hmm. of software developers have already been remote workers. They love it. They, that's the way they savor it. And they had a culture that was built for that because already half their team was in Ukraine or in Asia. So they were already built around it. But like I, I then go up where I was COO for the CRE, they're, the, they're violently, we're going back the second we can because of the 10 people they hired during COVID, they lost eight because their culture is so built off of relationships that go back 10, 20 years. Some of these guys work with each other so long that it was so insular that there was no way, there was no chink in the armor for a new person to break through. Mm. And it really disenfranchised those new people. So I think the problem is culture takes a long time, as we've all talked about, to change. And all these people, especially CFOs, we love this whole new world because I don't need an office. I can save money. But if your culture can't adapt, you won't have any employees because like in this case of the CRE, they are a really tight team. In fact, of the people that stayed, the two were rebounds. They were people who had left during COVID to other companies. They quit to come back because they needed to be part of their tribe. Right. And that's the thing that I still, I'm still at a, not sure I probably lean to where Lindsay is talking about is like, it, culture takes a while and, you, and companies have to commit. It's not just because it's easy that we're all going to go remote or we're all going to go hybrid. You have to commit your culture to do that. And, you know, tech, of course, has always been more resilient to that because that's the way they wanted it, Pete. But other industries are now saying, hey, we can do that too. But their culture is just simply not built for it. Mm. Yeah, I can add something. Um, we've had a strong culture since the beginning. And what we found is, the tools that we use to actually um, have workshops with our clients, we are using on ourselves. So Miro, I, I mentioned earlier in the call, um, an online kind of collaboration tool became a place where um, we had um, award ceremonies, we had holiday parties, um, just as you would facilitate a workshop with other clients or with others, we are facilitating our own kind of experience using the tools. Um, and it really comes down to people, right? If people really find that uh, a strong culture is important and they're willing to kind of go the extra mile, maybe stay on a Zoom call, um, do an Airbnb experience. We just had one uh, where two brothers from Italy taught my team how to make pasta. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was amazing and unexpected. Um, but if, if people aren't bought into that, right? If they don't want that, then it's hard to force someone where it's hard to kind of have that as an expectation. It really has to come from, um, it has to come from within. So I think culture, um, culture has been important and will continue to be important. Um, but I do think that uh, once uh, there's an option of in-face or in-person um, collaboration, um, even if we do have a hybrid working style, like one of the things that um, my team has been talking about is we do need to have some type of outlet where we can connect or reconvene um, because it goes back to that community, that sense of community. I think that's really important and people look for that uh, within work. And um, I think that's something that a lot of workers are waiting for. Like they're looking to reconnect and, and actually go, go back into building those relationships that they've had um, in the past. Kathan, Dreamforce will not forever be virtual. <laughs> It's not going to be the same, huh? <laughs> I don't. I don't think so. I mean, um, the city of San Francisco probably is uh, hurting because of the virtual nature of it. But um, 
but yeah, uh, virtual uh, in-person events will are definitely um, going to, to live on past this year. <laughs> Well, this has been a terrific conversation, uh, but given that we're all working from home, my wife is telling me we have to wrap this up because we have dinner reservations. So uh, <laughs> uh, I want to I want to thank uh, Vivian, Albert, Bob, and Katon, our panelists. Um, this was just you know terrific, and we really appreciate your time and contribution. Of course, Lindsay for moderating the panel, um, and our alumni relations team, Leanne and Carolyn, for helping us get this organized and also to LA MBA and the other clubs in Los Angeles. So I uh, also wanna thank, thank everybody who attended tonight. Uh, this was recorded and it will be up on our, our YouTube channel. I guess, I guess we're standing one of those up. Uh, if you need uh, a link to it, we can get that out and uh, we'll see you at our next event and have a, uh, have a great evening, everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, bye-bye. Thanks so much, bye.